Preaching Grace Ministries is delighted to bring the following sermon to you. We pray that God will use this sermon to challenge you and to bless you. Please feel free to share this sermon in its full, original form. And now, declaring the whole counsel of God to you, passage by passage, is Preaching Grace teacher, Simon Turner. Please take your Bible and turn with me to Psalm 13. Psalm number 13. And we'll read this psalm together. It's six verses long. And this is such a helpful little psalm. Uh, So often we need the counsel, the encouragement, and the help of this psalm as we go through our lives. Psalm 13. For the choir director, a psalm of David. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart all the day? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, or I will sleep the sleep of death. And my enemy will say, I've overcome him. And my adversaries will rejoice when I am shaken. But I have trusted in your loving kindness. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord. Because he has dealt bountifully with me. And I'm going to ask the Lord to bless these six verses uh, to our hearts this evening. As a commentary in the life of the Christian, that from time to time we go into a downward spiral. We enter into a period of depression. It's not necessarily clinical. It's not necessarily uh, physiological. But this is a spiritual matter that can overwhelm us and overcome us and just wash over us and threaten to drown us at various points in our life. There are times in our lives when we feel so bleak, so lifeless, so listless, so dry, so barren, stone cold, fearful, and even unchristian like. We find that we cannot read the Bible and we are just feeble in our prayers. The sad truth is that we feel trapped in a tunnel of abandonment, of desolation, and of frustration. So, what is the answer? For the Lord did not create us to be morose or bleak or unfulfilled. Why did Christ come? But he came to give us life in its fullness. How do we put things right? Are we simply to adopt the stiff upper lip and soldier on, hoping that things will just get better as we go along? Is there anything that we can do at all? Well, we've just read Psalm 13. Uh, You have read these words, these verses, and it's quite clear that Psalm 13 has this scenario in mind. David here uh, shares another insight into his experience. Uh, He feels far from God. He is fearful for his life because of either illness or enemies, perhaps even both. He can barely pray. And when he does try to pray, the words come out of his mouth and they land on the floor. They go nowhere. But somehow, somehow David pulls through. In some way, David finds a pinprick of light in this dark tunnel of despair. And David makes this journey public. He begins uh, and, and he says, this is a psalm of David, it's for the choir director. And that tells us that this is for public consumption. David is sharing his insights. He's sharing his journey. He's sharing what he's gleaned. He's sharing what he's learned. And he wants the people to sing with him as he goes through this. David's journey in this psalm is very much a personal lament. And that is the type or the category of this psalm. It's a personal lament. This is an emotionally charged psalm. In it, there is a heart cry to God for deliverance. 
And so this evening, if you are in despair, if you're confused, if you're upset, if you're on the brink of giving up, then this psalm is for you right now. But perhaps you're not there. But let me tell you, store up this psalm. Store up the truths that God teaches us in his word in this psalm for those days that might come, those days that will come, when you're faced with the problems and the difficulties as David is faced with. Interestingly enough, this is the psalm that formed the, the words of the very last breath of John Calvin. This is a psalm that is nicknamed the Howling Psalm because at the beginning four times David says, How long? This is a psalm that begins with a sigh. But gloriously it ends in a song. For David here it's quite clear that the old saying is quite true. Sorrows remember, sweeten the present joy. And David here is a man who's clinging to his faith in God. This evening, uh, as we think on this psalm, we find that this is a psalm that teaches us that there is light at the end of the tunnel. And I want you to find encouragement this evening. But we are going to go through the depths of despair with David. We're going to go through that journey that David had to go on to, to find God in the midst of his trials and troubles. And let me just give you a roadmap for the path that we're going to take through Psalm 13. Verses 1 and 2 tell us of David's loneliness. Verses 3 give us insight into David's longing. And verses 5 and 6 encourage us in David's loyalty. David's loneliness, David's longing, David's loyalty. And so let's turn to the first two verses and there we find David's loneliness. You know, oftentimes we do uh, feel apart. We do feel separated from God. The darkness that we find ourselves in feels empty. And the darkness seems to exclude us from God's presence. David felt this. He knew what this was like. He cries out to his God, why is this happening, Lord? How long will you let this go on for? And we see that David's loneliness is expressed in, in four different ways. Four times he says, how long, O Lord? And in verse 1 he begins by saying, how long, O Lord? Will you forget me forever? David feels forgotten. And it's God who's forgotten him. This isn't some old acquaintance that David met a couple of times decades before and, and they'd forgotten David's face and his name. This was somebody that David was intimately involved with. This is his God. This is the one to whom David bows down. And he feels he's got the impression that God doesn't even remember him. And this isn't the first time in the Psalms that David has cried this out. Psalms 6 verse 3 sees us uh, looking on David begging to God to tell him how long he would be left dismayed. When David is down, he's really down. When David is down, he's in grave difficulty. And you know, God's people can definitely have this sense of abandonment. God's people can have this sense that they are forgotten by God. God's people can even have the perception that they are omitted from God's presence. Jeremiah wrote of it in Lamentations 5 verse 2 where he said, Why do you forget us forever? Why do you forsake us so long? And I don't know, but perhaps this is the overwhelming fact in your life this evening. That you feel that God has forgotten you. You're face to face with the Lord and you stare into his face and you feel that there's a blank look as he looks upon you. As you go through life and the difficulties wash over you, you think God's forgotten me in my relationship struggles. God has not recalled me in the stresses of my job. God has buried me away in financial difficulty. God has left me out of his blessings of promotion, of companionship, of even happiness. 
And this is just the beginning because David goes on. And a second time David asks the Lord, how long? But this time in verse, uh, the second half of verse 1, David seems to think that God has not just forgotten him, but God is actually hidden away from him. And it says, how long will you hide your face from me? You remember the darkness of the cross. When the Lord Jesus Christ cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you hidden from me? And there we have the absolute intensity of someone feeling as if God has just disappeared. Well, verse 1 does continue here with David in deep despair. As he tries to remind God who he is, all of a sudden it's just as if God isn't there anymore. It's not that God is there and for just forgotten him, but God isn't actually there to even converse. David's trying to say to God, I'm, I'm your child, I'm your servant, I'm the one who worships you. But as he turns around to try and find God, he's got nobody to say these things to because the Lord is not there. And there is a real, a very deep anguish in David's cry. This isn't the cry of a man who's running away from God, but this is a man who's trying to run to God, but struggling to even find God, to find that pathway, to get the direction, to go, the trajectory, to follow, in order to be in the presence of God and find the joy of being in that presence. Whatever David looks, God isn't there. It's as if God now despises and rejects David altogether. And I know that you know what this is like. We all know what this is like. We realize in our despair we need to pray. And so we get to that place where we pray. Perhaps we're on our knees. Perhaps we're even in tears. And then as we pray, the very words of our prayer don't even reach the sea. It's as if God has hidden himself from us. We try to read the Bible just to get a modicum of comfort in some verse. We perhaps even go to those verses that have lifted us up and bolstered us in the past. And as we read them, there's no comfort there anymore. We are simply not experiencing the presence of God. And there's still more. A third time David comes and says, How long? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart all the day? This third element of David saying, How long? This third element of David being so lonely is that he's lost in the depths of discouragement. It's not that he just thinks God doesn't remember him. It's not that he just can't find God, but he's so discouraged at everything that he sees. The state that David finds himself in here, it's not so much about this relationship with God, but it is the condition of his life round about him. There's inner turmoil. David's unsettled. David is struggling to latch on to something that's positive. He simply can't find any hope any joy, any excitement. And as we read verse 2 there, the first part of it, it's almost as if David is physically wasting away. Life is just draining out of him in the sense of all hope, all energy, all enthusiasm. The difficulties piled one on top of the other in his life. Everywhere he turns and he looks, he finds something more to distress him. And you know, that might be the lament of your soul this evening. Father, all the things that I see are simply a source of discouragement. And I'm being sapped of any expectation, any hope, any desire to look for. And in that, we can't, even, we can't even contemplate looking for God. Perhaps you're even thinking, what's the point of looking for God? You find yourself in such a desperate state of discouragement. Let me plead with you. Keep listening. We've got one more how long. And then we will be in the position of David lifting us up through his words. But 
David's final or fourth element or facet of his loneliness is found just at the end of verse 2 where he says, how long will my enemy be exalted over me? Here we have an open wound. And David just thinks everything is rubbing salt. This next experience of loneliness that David speaks of comes from how he perceives that he is beaten down by his enemies. David can find no victory. He simply can't hold on to something that would give him the feeling that he's on the way up. Every which way David turns, he finds another knife that is being stuck into him. And those who confront David, those who oppose David, just simply seem to be winning. They are the ones that are in the ascendancy. And David's on his way down. It's possible we don't really know the circumstances of this psalm, but it's just possible that there was some uh, period in David's life where he writes this psalm where there were enemies, physical enemies, men and women who came against him and seemed to be winning. But also it's just possible speaking and looking at this little portion of the verse that David is speaking of an illness here. And David says, this thing in my life is just on the verge of an irreversible trial. And there's impeccable logic in that. Because when we feel lonely, when we feel that God is not there, of course it seems that everything else will win. We know that we are weak. We know that we can't do it ourselves. We know that we need God. And when he's not there, the world, the enemies, the problems all seem to pile victory upon victory. There is a head of steam in the life of the enemies, the opponents that we face that seems utterly uh, immovable and unstoppable. You know, this tunnel of spiritual difficulty can be entered into with great ease. It's in this tunnel that we find the experience of loneliness. And when we feel that loneliness, it's just as if everything is against us. But light does begin to shine. Because we can leave verses 1 and 2 behind now. And from verses 1 and 2, we move forward into verses 3 and 4. And in verses 3 and 4, what we learn and what we see and what we read is of David's longing. In other words, David hasn't just given up in the sense that he's going to let the loneliness triumph and continue. In the depths of a spiritual tunnel, there is unpleasantness. But as Christians, we have to realize that there is a way forward, that there is something that we can do. And we now start to see David finding relief. Because for David, the light has begun to shine. And what we can benefit from here is seeing how David finds that light. It's uh, the very nature of David's improvement here that he longs for the right thing. When we're in that lonely state, we have to long for the right thing. And verse 3 says this, Consider and answer me, O Lord my God, despite all of his fears that the Lord has hidden from him, despite all the fears uh, that God uh, is not answering him, despite all the fears that circumstances will win, David keeps praying. Oh, his prayers might be hitting the floor and not the heights of heaven, but he keeps praying. He doesn't feel like praying, but he keeps praying. Not a congregational prayer, but the very heartfelt, open heart surgery of prayer in the private place. And David prays. And he wants to talk with God. David is begging here with his God to simply take and board his struggle. David wants God to know of his concerns. And above all, David wants God to answer him and to help him and to pull him through. You know, the answer to our difficulties is straightforward in the sense that we should know what it is that we have to do. Whatever it is that you're facing or whatever it is you're about to face, what is it you're to do but to pray and to keep praying? And then pray some more. 
The light of hope will always shine when we have the desire for God to listen to us. Because it's only God who can help us. And there is an answer that David wants from God. He's quite specific here. As verse 3 continues, he says, Enlighten my eyes or I will sleep the sleep of death. David's saying, God, pull me out of this. He's not blaming God. He's not saying, God, I'm here because of you. He's not saying, God, I'm here because you have wanted me uh, to fall into this pit. But he's saying, God, pull me out. However I've got here, you're the one that can lift me. You're the one that can reestablish me. You're the one who can put that hope back into my very soul. And David wants to be beyond the reach of his enemies. He wants to avoid death. He wants the gleam. He wants the sparkle to be back in his eye. And in order to move ahead, he's saying, God, grant me wisdom here. Show me the way. Let it be your way, Lord. Let it be your doing. And here is our prayer. Lord, give me all that I need. Lord, meet the deficit in my life, the deficit that perhaps I've created, the deficit that society has dealt me, the deficit that I'm there through no fault of my own, but Lord, just just make that up and, and help me. Let me tell you and encourage you this evening that there is no state that we find ourselves in that should stop us from praying. Asking God to smile on us is always a good prayer to pray. When we ask God for encouragement, he will shine his face upon us. So never stop longing for God to give you his blessing. Don't prefer the comfort of the world to the blessing of God. Too often the comfort of the world is quick and it's easy and accessible. But how long does the comfort of the world last? Seeking the comfort of the world is like the gambler trying to recover his losses by putting his next bet on. But to invest in the encouragement and the joy and the love of God is like taking your money and putting it in the bank with a ridiculously high rate of interest. Always flee to the Lord for your help. And this next verse, verse number four, shows us that David wants God to remove certain things from his life. He says, and my enemy will say I've overcome him. David's not defeatist in this, but he wants the Lord to stop his enemies having the upper hand. He wants the Lord to stop the enemies, whether they are physical soldiers or, or politicians or, or, or just normal enemies or whether it is illness, David is saying, Lord, stop this thing from having the success that it's got. Because David knows unless God intervenes, then he's done for. And he can't overcome this affliction on his own. He longs for the absolute victory. He longs for it to be God's absolute victory. He longs to rejoice in the victory that God will give. He longs to actually lift his voice and say, God, you're the one who saved me completely. Don't let the enemies have the last word. Don't let them have the last laugh. You know, we should want God to give us the victory. Maybe your spiritual tunnel this evening, the darkness of that tunnel is caused by some sin that seems to have just taken over your your life. Some sin that you cannot seem to get the, the upper hand over. Well, pray, Lord. Don't let the enemy be able to say of me, I've overcome him or her. Ask God to lift us from everything that would plunge us into despair. Ask God to come and put that enemy in their place for the glory of God. Of course, understandably, we now see David longing for freedom from ridicule. It's bad enough when you're beaten, isn't it? But when somebody laughs at you as you're lying flat on your face, that's a painful injury to endure. 
And David says, and my adversaries, verse 4, continuing, and my adversaries will rejoice when I am shaken. As David's enemies think they are triumphing over him, they're crowing, they're whooping, they're celebrating, they're high-fiving each other. These are the great celebrations of an ungodly people. David's honor is at stake, and he longs for God to prevail. And, God, and David wants God to prevent these enemies from having any reason to rejoice. This is what he longs for. But see how David isn't asking for God to pour his wrath on the enemies. He's not saying God obliterate them. He's not saying God wipe them out. He's just saying God stop them from having this. David wants his own situation to be resolved. And this inner spiritual battle that David is fighting can only be resolved positively by God's strength. And let me tell you, if you long for God to bring and work his strength into your situation, you're longing for the best thing that you could ever hope for. But that longing is not some forlorn hope. It's not the longing of a, a genie in a bottle. It's not the longing for a knight in shining armor. But it's the longing for the God who's almighty. The God who's sovereign. The God who loves you with an everlasting love. To bring his right hand, his whole power, into your difficulty and give you relief. By longing for spiritual victory, you're even longing for God's honor to be known. It's a good thing to long for spiritual well-being. It's right to desire that your relationship with God is healthy. Because when your relationship with God is healthy, it doesn't matter what's taking place. You have the assurance, you have the confidence, you have the joy, you have the sense of belonging. And you know that God is doing all things to protect you. So pursue a positive emotional state with God so that he would have his rightful place in your life. And this lament of David that began in the depths of verses 1 and 2, in his loneliness, has taken a step or a few rungs up the ladder in verses 3 and 4 through his longing, but we reach the top, we, we find the blazing light in verses 5 and 6 where we find David's loyalty. You know, for David, nothing could be so bad that he would ever turn and reject God. And here is our template. No matter how bad it gets, we should never reject God. We're always to trust him. We're always to love him. We're always to come to him. But why? If I'm suffering, if I'm dejected, if I'm not getting what I need, why should I turn to God? Why should I be loyal when I am the one who's in anger? Let me take you back to what I said about Christ dying on the cross. On the cross, Christ said, God, why, Father, why are you abandoning me? Why are you forsaking me? And why did God abandon him? But Christ became sin for us. And Christ bore the penalty that we deserve. So that we would have an eternity of blessing after blessing, after blessing. How could so great a sacrifice not place in us a sense of loyalty that could not be shaken? Remember God sent his son to make you a child of God. And David knew this. You know, we might have expected David to cut and run. We've seen that with Jonah recently, haven't we? But David stays loyal because he knows his God. And verse 5 begins, he says, but I've trusted in your loving kindness. What's crucial here is that David knows God. David's not a stranger to God. David's not learning piece by piece what God might be like. He's spent his life getting to know God better and better. And he can say, it's your love, God, that, that gives me trust in you. I know that you love me. David knows that God hasn't stopped loving him. And it's this knowledge that changes the mood of this lament. It's this knowledge that changes David from speaking of despair uh, to talking of delight. 
It's the knowledge of God's love that lets the light spill into the tunnel. You know, maybe David heard something from a priest. Maybe David read something in the Scriptures that he had, the law that he had, something that reminded him of God's goodness. And it is like a light bulb moment. For David, the storm might be raging round about him, but he knows where his safety lies, and it's in the love of God. And the truth is that as we go through the difficulties of life, difficulty and trust can coexist. Pain and joy can be bedfellows. They can be experienced at the same time. Because it might hurt as we experience what's round about us. It might cause us tears and sadness. But we can still find this joy in the God who loves us. So when we're in the darkness of despondency, when we're in the mire of melancholy, we can and we must still trust in the light that floods the spiritual tunnel. And who is the light that floods the tunnel but Christ Jesus himself? The one who said, I am the light of the world. The one who, as a light, burns away the power of sin. The one who, as a light, shines on our feet and guides our path. The love of God is steadfast. And as the hymn writer said, the love of God is greater far than tongue or pen could ever be. And that's the love that's in your heart. That's the love that floods your life. And it's this truth, this awareness that floods David's heart with rejoicing. And he says, My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. Doesn't really need an awful lot of explanation, this little portion of the verse. He's happy that God has saved him. He's delighted that God has delivered him. And it's this attachment that David has made in his own life. He's attached his heart to God. And so his heart depends only upon God for joy and for happiness and for loyalty. There may be a craziness erupting all around David. There may be danger lurking around every corner for David. There might even be calamity upon calamity that is just coming over him. But David still sees the Lord. His eyes are fixed on his God. And he understands that divine salvation is his because God has given it to him. And you know, it's right for us to go go right back to ground zero. It's right for us to go back to the very beginning of our loving relationship with God, revisit our salvation. When everything else seems so difficult, get back to basics. Lord, you've saved me. I'm not going to hell because you've saved me. I'm going to heaven. And however many years I've got to endure in this world, they'll soon be forgotten with the ever-increasing joy of being in the presence of Christ for all eternity. How could we not remain loyal to so wonderful a truth? But as we look at David, this man, he's put everything into a godly perspective because he goes into verse 6, and he says in verse 6, very plainly, I will sing to the Lord. Why? Because he's dealt bountifully with me. He's dealt with me in a way that is good. He's dealt with me in a way that blesses me. The close of this lament, this song, is a proof that David hasn't stopped believing. His faith is secure. His trust is intact. He knows and he loves his God for all that his God has done for him. He's not feeling sorry for himself in the sense that he thinks God is just against him anymore. He knows as he works it through. And this is the beauty of prayer. As you pray, you work things through. It's not self-help. It's not self-awareness. It's not meditating to find the answer to the problem. But what it is, is praying to God who by His Spirit will speak peace and comfort into your heart. Yes, there's a tension between how David feels. 
and what he knows to be objectively true. David feels down, but as he comes to the truth about who God is, he prefers to trust the truth of who God is and not to trust in his feelings that change from day to day. That's not to disparage feelings or emotions, but they can change and they are open to the vagaries of what happens. They can be open even to the vagaries of the diet that we're on, the food that we eat. They can be open to the vagaries of the sunlight that we experience. Sometimes they're open to the vagaries that we don't even know. And we can feel low and we've got no knowledge of why we feel like that. But David isn't trusting in that. Something's shifting. He's trusting in the rock of his salvation. He's trusting in the God that doesn't change. His joy is located in his Savior. And what David will not ignore or disbelieve is the goodness of God. Those who know God see his goodness in all things. And we've had to think this evening, where is it my loyalty lies? Our loyalty is to the God who has been good to us infinitely more than we could ever have deserved. God is so good to us that his goodness outstrips what we could have earned had we been the perfect person and never even said. His goodness goes beyond that. He has given us salvation. Lost darkness and the crimson color of sin, he sent Christ to die. And God then brings us into his family. He adopts us. You know, we're not like some of these false religions of the world where we see God as mystical or far off. How is it Jesus taught us to pray? What are the first two words of that prayer in Matthew 6? Our Father. There's intimacy. There's closeness. There's a relationship of love and of protection and of blessing. And God has given us confidence that we can come and call him Father. How often do we do that? How often do we say Father? And thirdly, and I know I've mentioned it before, he's given us the goodness of heaven that we've come. It's not that our circumstances or our, that our emotions are irrelevant, but they should never cloud our worship. They should never cloud our loyalty to the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith is what glues us to Christ. Faith is what takes us through the difficult path. Faith is what God gives us to see light at the end of the tunnel. We shouldn't turn inward, but we should look heavenward. The person who looks heavenward will always see Christ. And it's Christ who leads us, not just into the light at the end of the tunnel, but he leads us as the light that has reached into the tunnel clocks. Our loyalty will ensure that well, we will wait patiently for what God will bring to us and give to us and help us with. Our loyalty will say, now, I'm not going to move. I'm with Christ, and that is not going to change. We see light at the end of the tunnel only by surrendering and praying to God. Seeing light at the end of the tunnel, it's not about thumbing our nose or sticking our tongue out at difficulty. It's not about having the stiff upper lip but it's about understanding how to react to it. And we react to difficulty, or we should react to difficulty, the same way that we respond to joyous times, by trusting our Lord. You know, we might feel desperate loneliness, but this should fuel our deep longing for God, and this in turn should inspire us and deepen us in our loyalty to Christ. It does us good to remember the words of George Matheson's hymn, 
O love that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe, that in thine ocean depths its flow me richer, full of being. O joy that seekest me through pain, I cannot close my heart to thee. I trace the rainbow through the rain and feel the promise is not vain, that morn shall tearly be. Beautiful work. But let us also hold on to the words of Psalm 13 that began with that sigh, How long, O Lord? But the psalm that ends saying, I will sing to the Lord because he is good to me. May you look to Christ alone for your every hope. May he cause you to sing with rejoicing as you gaze upon him. And may you live in the goodness of the salvation that is yours for all eternity. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you. We thank you for the life of David. We thank you for the pen of David. But we thank you that David was a man who was open to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so we thank you for your words this evening. We go through so many difficult times. Just the natural progression of life brings us much despair and sadness and heartache at times. Sometimes, Father, we admit there are things that we bring upon ourselves through being unwise or cavalier. And yes, Father, there are even times where there are enemies and opponents who inflict pain upon us. But yet we can share in this psalm that while it might feel lonely at times, you have given us in the Holy Spirit someone who will cause us to long for you. Someone who will help us stay loyal to you. And so we pray for your comfort. We pray for your arms to be around us and to help us. And we thank you, Father, that you have lifted us beyond where we belong. To a new place. To the place of adoption. To the place of belonging. To the place of divine, sovereign, never-ending love. We thank you this evening as we pray in the name of the Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.